Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have back with us in the studio, Marika Brousseau. Marika, welcome. Thank you so much for having me here again. We're always glad to have you, Marika. Uh, you are a third generation Scientologist and you left the church in 2009? That's correct, yes. After one year in the Sea Org. Yeah. Now, your parents are Hayden and Lucy James, mm -hmm. who were in the church for a very long time. What people need to know is that the Church of Scientology is made of people. Mm -hmm. And particularly, it's made of extended families. Yes. I mean, vir virtually at one time, wasn't your entire family in the church? Yeah. So my grandmother, who's um, OT4, she had uh, seven children and five of them were Scientologists or are Scientologists. You were born into the church. Yeah. That means five of your aunts and uncles were Scientologists. Mm -hmm. What's it like growing up in immersion, total immersion into the Church of Scientology? <laughs> um, what's it like? I, I can't even describe it. I mean, you know, as, as I do, you know, as I speak to you more and, and do more and more interviews with you and others, um, I'm able to, you know, explain parts of it but that's a very broad question. I don't think I could explain it in one go. Um, I, I'm very lucky. There are many children that I grew up with. That's all they saw. That's all they will see. Um, I, I was very fortunate that my parents refused to abort my baby sister and my parents were booted out of the Sea Org we were made to go to a class five organization. Um, so I was able to see the world a little bit more. Um, I was put into a, a public school, which in the UK, they're, they're C of E, they're Protestant. So I learned about uh, Jesus Christ and uh, the Christian faith. And I met people that weren't Scientologists. I mean, really, there's not much Scientology in the UK. And what of it, you know, that the amount that there is, there's the, the concentration is in East Grinstead, which is in the south south of England, um, in West Sussex. So where I was in Birmingham, which is sort of the, the center of England, there was hardly any Scientology. So I didn't have any, you know, I went from, you know, 520 children in the pack area that were all Sea Org kids Everyone I knew was a Sea Org member or was a Sea Org kid. You know, their parents were all Sea Org members or staff members. To then going to a school where nobody even knew what the word Scientology meant. Marika, one interesting thing you told me mm. uh, off the air is when you were first introduced to the Christian concept of death, it was shocking to you. Exactly. So it was around Easter time and we were learning... Um, about Jesus Christ uh, being crucified on the cross and how he had um, died on the cross. And then uh, after three days, I believe it is, he rose again. Correct, mm -hmm. yes. So I was saying to one of my friends, but, uh, but I don't understand the significance of that. You know, we, we all rise again. Um, Re reincarnation. Reincarnation, right. Yeah, Scientology teaches reincarnation. So the idea that Jesus rising would be unremarkable mm -hmm. until my friend explained i mean I, I was sort of like but we all do it we all once we die we get a new body mm -hmm. and we live again but she said but but jesus didn't get a new body he rose in the same body and i was fascinated by that like oh wow how old were you it's about eight or nine now, did the idea that people died and went to heaven? Well, this was the other concept. So, so that's what she was trying to explain to me as well. Not only, you know, was this unusual, you know, that he rose again, because you, what's normal is that people die and they don't rise ever again. They don't get a new body. They don't ever rise in the same body. Yes, in the in the Christian worldview, you. The, the, the Bible says it's appointed unto man to die once and then judgment. Mm -hmm. But in the Scientology world and, and in the Eastern world, and this is the where Hubbard borrowed the concept from, reincarnation, you live eternally. Mm -hmm. 
So the idea that you would live one life and die and then be judged, how did that strike you as a Scientologist child? Oh my gosh, well, I just thought the idea of death was, I just didn't understand it. I, I was trying to imagine it. I was trying to imagine being in a coffin in the ground and not thinking, not seeing, n n nothing. I was trying to imagine this sort of nothingness and, and I really couldn't wrap my head around it. No, well, and, and the reason I ask is because you grew up in a Scientology world where reincarnation is a given. Mm -hmm. So the Christian view of, of death sounded different to you. Mm -hmm. You couldn't Extremely really, final. Yeah, you couldn't think with it, as they say. Mm. Now, also growing up in the Church of Scientology, what, one thing that would have been normal to you was disconnection. Right. What were you taught as, about disconnection as a child? You know, I, I, I saw it happen around me. Um, it didn't affect me personally. Um, until I was 15. Uh, I was on staff in Birmingham morgue and um, my mom was the ED, my dad was the senior CS. Um, now my biological father who I hadn't really had much contact with, actually the last time I saw him was that time I went for my eighth birthday and I, I struggled to get home again because he found out that my mom was on the RPF and there was no one in LA to look after me. Yes, that's as we covered in our last interview. Right. So, and I, I, I want to recommend to listeners who haven't that they hear the first interview we did. It was a very fascinating look at childhood in uh, Pack Base mm. and, and other places. So what happened in the disconnection when you were 15? Okay, so I haven't seen my father in seven years. I don't really know him much. Um, I think we might have spoken on the phone once or twice, but he invites me to visit him. Now, at this point, my brother is living with him. My brother's been living with him, I think, for about two years now. Um, so my dad gets me a ticket. I, there was some um, misgivings about me going because uh, I think he was, he was under investigation by the church at the time. Something to do with a company that he worked for. Now, he was a Scientologist. Your biological father? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he and he was being investigated by the church for some reason. Right. So we knew we'd heard something about a committee of evidence being held. And so my parents sat me down and were like, we're not sure if we're going to let you go because we think he's, you know, in, in some sort of ethics trouble and we don't know how that's going to play out. And then my mom spoke to my dad and he sort of poo-pooed the whole thing. Oh, it's no big deal. And anyway, I ended up going. I got there, I stayed with him for a couple of weeks. Now, towards the end of my stay, well, sort of during the stay, he let it be known to me that he would like me to come and live with him. And um, I could go to high school and he would teach me to drive and get me a car and eventually I could go to college and you know, may, maybe get a get a job being a lawyer or something like that. Um, he worked in a law firm at the time. So towards the end of my stay, he sort of opened up a little bit more about um, his feelings about Scientology. And he basically told me that he was going to get declared. He says, they're trying to declare me. It, it was hard for me to contemplate. Uh, I, I didn't really know him too well. Um, and I didn't know what he was supposedly being declared for. I knew being declared was like an extremely scary thing. Um, one of the worst things that can happen to you as a Scientologist. But the way he said it was like, they're trying to do this to me. Like, I'm not an SP. Like, why would they be trying to do this to me? So I was kind of like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. Now... <laughs> Then he told me some very interesting stuff. He told me about David Miscavige beating people. He told me about uh, David Miscavige um, really, you know, taking over the power of the church and um, some of the things that, that David Miscavige is being accused of today. He told me back then uh, in 
1997. So that long ago, he told you that David Miscavige was beating people mm -hmm. and had taken over the church. At this time, though, you're 15. Mm -hmm. Right. And how do you think of David Miscavige at this time? I think he's a petty little bitch. Really? Yes. And, and I'll you know, go into more detail about why I think David Miscavige is a petty little bitch later. I, it, it, it has to do well, with this whole disconnection. But in terms of this story just here between my father and I, um, yeah, he opened, he opened up about some of the things that he felt, you know, was going on in the church. And uh, he definitely blamed David Miscavige for that. And that was essentially what he got declared for was for bad-mouthing David Miscavige. Although his declare doesn't quite say that, but that's really all that he was doing. He wasn't doing anything else wrong. Now, at this point, I've flown back to England, um, and, it's a, and, and it was a couple of months later that I got told by my mom, you know, look, your dad did end up being declared. Um, but I don't... I, I don't think I ever told my parents about what he'd said. I, you know, I had to sort of brief them about some of the things, and I did say some of the things, but some things I'd forgotten. Well, it also opens a can of worms. Yes, very and much so. In the Church of Scientology, you certainly learn to keep your mouth shut. Mm -hmm. No, I wasn't trying to hide anything. I just, I think I didn't know what to make of it all. Um, and it was very hard for me. It would have been, oh, I see. It would have been hard for me to leave at that time because um, I really believed in Scientology. Um, and so the way he laid it out to me was it's basically all a farce. And although I believed some of the things he was saying to me, I didn't believe that. So that didn't ring true with me. And it wasn't... Um, until 2009 when these things came up again that I started you know thinking more about them and it was easier for me to leave when I left because there was a huge um, independent movement you know it's a very it's a it's a, the, the independent movement is sort of like a, a halfway house for for Scientologists uh, leaving the Church of Scientology how I feel about about Scientology is there are some things that work and that can be quite useful, some of the counseling procedures, um, but then there are some things which aren't. Well, this brings us to the subject of disconnection. Does disconnection work? No. When you were told to disconnect from your biological father, what did you think? Well, originally I was asked to write him a disconnection letter and I was just like, really? Like, I have to write him and tell him, I'm never going to speak to you again, blah, 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 we're disconnected. And I just thought that it's really pointless. Um, I hadn't had much touch with him throughout my life anyway. You know, I hate to, I hate to say it, but, you know, when I came back home, it's not like he called me and said, hey, how was your flight? And, you know, thanks for staying. And he didn't keep in touch. So as, you know, and I think because he knew and, and, he knew I was going to come home and be like, you know, my dad has some pretty whack ideas about Scientology. You know, when he sat me down and he told me all that stuff and, you know, we had that heart to heart, you know, that was his, that was his last chance to try and get through to me. Um, and oh, I see. I, you know, that's really interesting how he's, how your biological father gambles on being disconnected from you to try to tell you the truth. He's taking a very calculated emotional risk. Yeah. But at the same time, he knows it's his only chance because he's about to get declared. So in context, he's going to try to talk to you one last time. And I can understand his motives as a father. Mm. And within the Church of Scientology, that is his last chance to try to speak to you. Mm -hmm. But it really doesn't, you know, at that point it falls on deaf ears because you're still in the church and you love, your, you love Hayden and Lucy, mm -hmm. your parents. So I can see how this puts you in a very difficult position and your biological father in a very difficult position. Yeah. And basically what happened was, it's not like somebody said to me, hey, he's an SP, you have to disconnect from him. What happened was, it's he's declared. 
he's declared a suppressive person. So within the church, within Scientology, you know, there are things, there are such things as suppressive people, I guess, essentially sociopaths. Okay. And they, they just, are. that's just who they are. Okay. But being declared one of those, you could, you could be declared a suppressive person um, because of bad auditing you didn't do or, or you did do or something like that. I mean, there's so many reasons you could get declared, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you are a sociopath. It just means you did some things wrong that the church didn't like. Like, do you understand? There's, there's, oh, there's yeah. two differences. There's the bad personality side of it where someone is just really messed up and is a sociopath. And then there's, you've broken the rules. So. Well, in other words, not all SPs are created equally. Not everyone who's declared as a monster. Right. And in fact, in the church, it's more the norm to be declared for not agreeing or going along with some of their draconian programs and wishes. Exactly. Uh, and, and this really, the power of disconnection, you know, being declared an SP in and of itself doesn't mean anything. It means that you're no longer a member of a church. Right. But the real power of disconnection, or, or, or the real power of an SP declare is it can no longer associate with your family and friends inside the church. Which I think is absolutely ridiculous because it, it makes no sense. Like, say the church got rid of that and they said, okay, look, you you've really messed us over you've you've broken the rules here in our church and we're not happy with you so we're going to excommunicate you from our church okay and you can come back if you do these steps but we're really not happy with you right now that's all well and fine and they they get their suppressive person declare declare issued everybody gets a copy their family friends whatever and it it is stated what they did okay, this is what Joe did wrong that we're unhappy right. about. You know, as, as the daughter, you know, reading that, I can see that. And then it's my choice. Well, now I'm aware of, you know, possibly some, you know, bad sides to this person. And I can, I can choose whether I want to associate with them or not. Why... Why does the church have to tell me, no, now you have to disconnect from that person? Like, isn't it enough that they've, that they've disagreed with that person and written a suppressive person declared that everybody gets? Marika, one thing the church claims is that they do not practice disconnection, that it's up to the individual to decide or if he or she wants to hang around with somebody. Is that true? No. It's not true and it actually makes me sick. Like it, it makes me feel ill in my stomach when I hear that. If you don't disconnect from that person who's been declared a suppressive person by the Church of Scientology, then you will be declared a suppressive person by the Church of Scientology. Let me just quickly finish up yeah, with my dad. Sure. I got put on the PTSSP course. No, so, can you tell can you tell our listeners PTSSP what right, that means? So it's the potential trouble source slash suppressive person course. So if you're connected to a suppressive person, you are a potential trouble source, and that is what the church is very 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 worried about. They're not. They're just very worried about you being PTS. So they don't want a scenario where you're on OT7 or you're an OT8 and you blow your brains out or you kill somebody um, or there's any bad PR connected with that. They want, you know, just good things from their parishioners. Well, this is their continual obsession with PR and good image. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so I got put on this course, which I guess it's like, if the church, <laughs> this is where that whole, you know, you have a choice thing comes in. Um, you don't have a choice. So if they think someone is a suppressive person, hey, look, even if that person isn't declared, say the church haven't declared them, but they, they think 
you know, your husband's a suppressive person because he's stopping you from donating or whatever it is, they'll put you on that course. They, to try and essentially make you think that that person is, is suppressing you and is um, holding you back in life. And you're supposed to have your own cognitions about things, but really it, it they're making you have your, have those cognitions. Well, and this course, is it sort of tailored to you disconnecting from somebody? Of course. Is it, it goes so into, whole... it goes in, you learn all about the PTS SP tech. So it's, it's all to do with, um, what a suppressive person is, um, their traits, their, their personalities, their objectives, how they become suppressive, um, um, how they suppress uh, the different types of being under their influence, being PTS to them. Um, so, so you learn those different methods. Um, you're essentially trying to learn how to control a suppressive person. Um, and you're taught that the main point is you either handle that suppressive person so that um, they're no longer a negative influence in your life or they don't have a hold over you or you disconnect from them. So that's the church's famous handle or disconnect. Exactly. That whole course is, is designed to do that. So you learn things to handle. You know, you learn about good roads, fair weather. If you have an antagonistic family member, how to sort of not bring up those antagonisms and, and uh, you know, just talk about the nice things. You know, you, you would be allowed to, to do a handling on an antagonistic family member, not someone who's declared by the church, you understand, um, but, but someone maybe just that's affecting you personally. They'd maybe allow you to do a handling for a few months, maybe let it go on for a year, but if that didn't handle, now you have to disconnect. After leaving the church, I reconnected with my father. Um, it had been almost 15 years and we're in touch again now. That's great. Yeah, we're both very happy about it. <laughs> and he's not a suppressive person after all. No, no, he's not. <laughs> he's quite nice. Marika, you have a recent situation with disconnection in your family. Yes. This involves your mom, mm -hmm. your aunt, and your cousin. Mm -hmm. How does it work? What's well, going on? Okay, so basically, um, my aunt has disconnected from her only child, m my cousin. So your aunt is in this Church of Scientology. Mm -hmm. She's disconnected from her daughter, mm -hmm. who is your cousin. Yeah. Um, my, my what cousin, happened? Uh, well, basically, so I have to backtrack a little bit, but... Um, you know, I grew up with my cousin in the CEO. Uh, she was one of the 520 in PAC in the 80s. Um, her mom was in the Sea Org, you know, with my mom. We, you know, we went off to England and um, they stayed in America. She joined the Sea Org at, I think, around the age of 13. Um, she was up at INT for about a year or two, um, then at PAC, and then she left by the time she was about 18, 19. Um, so your cousin, your cousin left the Sea Org when she was about eighteen or nineteen. Yeah, I'm thinking somewhere around, yeah, somewhere around nineteen ninety nine, two thousand. She went to college at UCLA. She got a degree, you know, got a good job. Um, when she left, she was handed a, a a freeloader bill, one which her mother fought to get lowered. So they they lowered it, and it, it was a nominal amount as freeloader bills go. It was $5,000, but my cousin refused to pay it. She said, no, um, this was done when I was a minor and I was told this was part of my schooling. I'm not paying this. So she never did. And she never had any uh, connection with Scientology since. She's just living her life. You know, she's in touch with her mom, um, my aunt, who, who continued on into the Sea Org. I have to tell you a little bit about my aunt's history. Um, Please. Okay, so, you know, she was uh, in the Davis mission with my mom in 1976, and then she joined the Sea Org in 1983. At, at some point, 
during the 80s, um, I think the mid 80s, uh, my aunt and her husband divorced and she remarried. So um, in around 1997, she gets pregnant, you know, by her new husband. Um, and they wanted to keep the baby. He, he didn't have any children. He'd never fathered any children. Um, so this was a, this was a big deal for them. You know, she was pregnant. They wanted to have this baby together. Um, they were determined to, to stay together and, and see this through, even though it's quite difficult in the Sea Org. So they were a Sea Org couple. Yes. Yes. So they refused to abort their child. Um, and they were punished for it. They were, they were made to eat their meals in a stairwell. They couldn't, they couldn't eat with the, the rest of the Sea Org members. They had to stand up eating their meals in a stairwell. Um, the, under the, the, the stress and the pressure that they were going through, um, my aunt had a miscarriage. You know, obviously, her and her husband were very upset about that. Um, and then around this time, he was physically attacked um, by one of his seniors. Um, and he, you know, had a, he got depressed. He, he had a suicidal thought. This is around 1997. Oh, anyway, later, um, my aunt starts having uh, physical problems um, with her spine. She's not able to do any physical work because it sort of it makes the situation worse. Anyway, she was ordered onto the post of the canteen in charge and she refused to do it. She just said, look, I, I can't, you know, that would, that would really break me physically. Um, and so she was ordered, you either do this or we're putting you on the RPF. So she had to sort of choose the lesser of two evils. So she, she chose to be the, the canteen IC. And, you know, she had to pick up heavy crates and, and food and bend over a lot, put things away. Anyway, her, her condition worsened. Um, she, you know, she had a lot of medical bills. She was going to the doctor frequently. Um, she was put on a reduced schedule because she couldn't, she couldn't handle a full Sea Org schedule. Um, and then uh, towards early 2006, she's just, the Sea Org want to get rid of her. She's, she's really not, she's not capable of, of working as much as they want her to. She's more of a liability. Now that she has this physical problem, um, I don't even know what, how to describe it, but it's, uh, you know, she has a, a physical problem with her spine. Um, so she has a disease. Yeah, she that, has some that, type it, of disease. I, I don't know if yeah. it's a disease, but it's the tissue around her spine is deteriorated. This is now 2006. Your aunt who miscarried in 1996 is struggling physically. She can't do the heavy work schedule right. on the Sea Org. That's right. Yeah, so she's, and, she's really struggling. She's on a reduced schedule. Um, she's not worth it to them. They want to offload her. They want to get rid of her. You know, they do this to old people, right? Oh, the, the, yeah. The minute you weaken in Sea Org, you're gone. Yeah, exactly. So they want to get rid of her, so they use this thought that her husband had, 97, and so he has a suicidal thought in 1997. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to 2006, they want to offload her. Right. So they say. So they just. Yeah, we, we have to offload him. And what we're going to do is we want you to go with him to look after him. We want to make sure that he's okay. And, and so you go with him and you're not going to have a freeloader bill. So they, they get rid of him first. And, you know, I think a. A couple of weeks later, she arrives, um, and then they're together. So your aunt and uncle are out of the Sea Org. Then what happens next? She gets a job as a personal assistant to sort of a big wig Scientology OT. Um, 
He's the mission holder for about four missions, I think. She's earning good money. And then they act, they rescind on no freeloader bill. And they decide that, that they're actually going to charge her. So when she's, when she's kicked out of the Sea Org or routes out, and then they know she's making money, then they want freeloader. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so she ended up paying them uh, twenty-two thousand dollars. That is so like the Church of Scientology. Here, you can go. You don't have to pay the bill. Oh, yeah, you do. We changed our mind. Yeah, we changed our mind because we realize you're earning money now. We see it. We want it. It's disgusting. So she paid. Oh, it's very disgusting. So she paid the twenty-two thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Meanwhile, your cousin graduated from UCLA. Mm-hmm years ago and hasn't been involved with the church right um although she you know she keeps in touch with friends she had growing up and friends she knew in the church who are now out so in 2008 my aunt receives a call from osa from um from donatella and donatella says um you know that my cousin is is in trouble she's you know basically connected to these um attacking sps and my aunt has to disconnect from her And my aunt says, no, let me go and handle her. So she goes to visit my cousin. Um, And then this is where Tommy Davis and Jessica Feshback come in. They come and meet with my cousin and my cousin's husband. Really? Tommy and Jessica go to try to handle your cousin Mm -hmm. and her husband? Yes. And they reach an agreement, which is my cousin. My cousin won't talk about you know, things that went on at at INT. Um, She won't be connected to SPs, attacking SPs. Um, She won't join the Headley's lawsuit. She'll move out of the area and she'll still be allowed to see her mother and they'll have their connection. She won't be disconnected from. Then the threat was, if you don't, from Tommy Davis and Jessica, if you don't do these things, you'll be disconnected. You will be disconnected from. And will be. Yes. And and my cousin tried to counter with, if you disconnect me from my mom, I will do these things. We know that Tommy Davis was very active, but I don't think people realize the degree that he was active at that point point in time in severing relationships or threatening to Mm. because when the indies exploded Mm -hmm. onto the internet they were a huge threat to the church oh yeah and this is where osa donatella kevinar her husband fritz everyone began policing the internet (laughs) that's right facebook police here we come so your your cousin has to agree not to be a party to claire headley's lawsuit Mm -hmm. what happened with that in part, it was asking for back pay um, for Sea Org members. That was a part of it. Claire Headley and my cousin were good friends. My cousin gave up a lot. She, she sort of made a deal with the devil. Um, she, she gave up a lot to keep that connection with her mother. And see, this is the power of emotional blackmail. Mm-hmm. The church falsely calls it disconnection, but it's actually emotional blackmail and is this one reason you call David Miscavige a petty little bitch? Exactly. It's exactly why I call him a petty little bitch. Because it's at his whim. You know, my cousin, she, you know, she's she's met with certain ex-Scientologists. Um, he, As is her right. Yeah. We have, free, we have freedom of association in America. She can meet with anyone. Yeah, exactly. But... You know, within the Church of Scientology, and it, this is David Miscavige. This is him. This is how petty he is. He's like, oh, yeah, you're allowed to eat, meet with um, this attacking person, Paul and Mark. And yeah, you can have lunch with Bob every other Sunday. Oh, but you're talking to Tracy? Oh, no. We're going to disconnect you now. Well, why not Tracy? Is this purely Just, at his whim? Exactly. He is so petty. He's like a. He's like a teenage high school girl. That's what he reminds me of. Elaborate. So so my other grandmother, who's never been in Scientology, she's probably at 
attacked Scientology or said worse things about it than my cousin. But my aunt isn't being forced to disconnect from her. This is why you honestly want to know. Sure. Because my aunt's going to get an inheritance. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, so when your grandmother, who's not a Scientologist, passes away, your, your aunt, who is a Scientologist, stands to inherit a lot of money. Exactly. Therefore, she can have that relationship. Mm -hmm. That is so cynical. I know, and that's why David Miscavige is a petty little bitch, because... He in part will, you know, he's fine with taking money from my grandmother that hates him. But he won't let my cousin, you know, go to, to SeaWorld with Jenna Miscavige without disconnecting my cousin from her mother. So your cousin knows Jenna Miscavige. Mm -hmm. And David Miscavige is going to police anyone connected to Jenna. Right. Marika, the question I have to ask as an adult man, <laughs> David Miscavige, and, and help me here, mm -hmm. David Miscavige promotes himself as a global ecclesiastical leader. He has his attorney praise him that he's one of the leading figures of our age, <laughs> but it sounds like he's sitting in his office mm -hmm. looking at all these relationships in the church. Yeah. I mean, if you were really a global executive, you don't have time for this nonsense. No. He would just it's be like, he would just be getting on with things, but he's not. It's it's very bizarre. It's you know, he has some sort of status issue and it's it's like you're allowed to be friends with this person and this person is allowed to be friends with this person. Okay, here's the kicker. My cousin is best friends with Jenna Miscavige's brother. And she's no. been allowed to be best friends with him during those six years, like from 2008 till now. And no one has ever raised an issue. She even went on vacation with him. But she friends Jenna Miscavige on Facebook and she's suddenly disconnected from her mother. Then it's World War III. Mm-hmm. I mean, really, again, I repeat my question. Don't these, doesn't David Miscavige and the people know that have anything better to do? They're, they're down to the level of deciding who can like who. Exactly. Yeah. This is high school. Exactly. That's why I say he's like a little teenage high school girl. Because funnily enough, the high school boys didn't really get into that that much. <laughs> it no. Was the it girls. Was... I mean, he's essentially a high school girl. Well, I wouldn't argue with you there. It, it, it can be very petty and vindictive. It would be funny except for the fact that it actually destroys families. Right. And, and, and that's, what, that's where my anger is with this. So I really feel like my aunt should know better because we already had a, a tragedy in our family due to disconnection. What was the tragedy? Oh, um, okay, my, my grandmother, the OT4, um, she... She committed suicide. She committed suicide? Right. Um, yeah, what happened was, um, you know, she, she had a disagreement with the church. Um, I don't necessarily want to go into all the details. Um, but she no, we don't need to. Right. So she disagreed with the church. Um, they um, pushed back against her disagreement and she asked for a refund of her money. Um, they then said that, you know, basically she was attacking and she was an SP and they kicked her out of the church and they made all of her Scientology children that were in the U.S. disconnect from her. So m my mother got sent to St. Hill. She got, my mother and my father were ordered to St. Hill. They got there, they were told you have to disconnect from your mother. My mother refused. Um, they wouldn't let them leave until they did. My mother agreed. She wasn't going to write a disconnection letter to her mother, but she said, I'll agree that while you're handling her, 
I won't speak to her. Um, now, your mother's in the Sea Org at this time. Well, she's in the UK. She's the ED of a Class 5 Org. Um, she's on garrison from the Sea Org. So she's still technically a Sea Org member, but she's, she's not working in a Sea Org Org. She's working in a Class 5 Org. The Class 5 Org's sort of a, a lower-level hell for Sea Org members. Yeah. The, you know, you, you get sent to a Class 5 Org if you don't abort your child. That was what was being done in the 80s and the 90s. Now, going back just for a moment, mm -hmm. Marika, what's the church's policy? Are you forced to write a disconnection letter? What happens? Yes. Basically, you have to go and see the MAA. You write the letter in front of them, and they have to approve it. So if you put something in there that they don't like, they'll make you change it. And then, you know, you, you once they've approved it, then you mail that out. They make So they make it look like you originated the letter and wrote it yourself, but the whole time they're behind the scene. Yes, exactly. And that's really the lie when Sylvia Stenard or any other church PR says, well, it's the individual's choice. They're omitting to state that they had to go to the MAA, mm -hmm. which is like a church police officer. They had to write it. We looked it. We, we reviewed it and approved it. And then we made them mail it. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of, you have a gun to your head, basically, because if you don't go in and write that letter, you could be disconnected. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. you have to. It's forced. This is forced. Nobody wants to do this. You know, nobody well, in their right mind wants to disconnect from their family. They're usually very devastated by it. And like I said, my mom refused. But, you know, she was allowed to leave on the grounds that, okay, you know, but the time it takes them to handle grandma, she won't, she won't speak to them. And I remember her at the time encouraging me to write to grandma. Um, she'd just gotten on the internet um, and we had a couple emails back and forth. And she said to me, you know, she said, you know, I'm, I, I'm not able to write to grandma right now, but could you, and could you tell her how you're doing and just be in touch with her? Um, so I did that. We had a couple emails back and forth. Um, so my mom's not able to talk to her. The other four children have officially dis disconnected from her with letters. Your grandmother has to be devastated. She has spent, what, her lifetime in the church? Yeah, she, now she's, she's spent, disconnected. Yeah, she spent a good few years in there. And, you know, her children, most of her children are there. Um, her grandchildren, I mean, it's the, it's the only life she knows at this stage. And she's, she's 70 years old. She's 70. Her family have disconnected from her. And then she gets this letter from the Church of Scientology that says, this is regarding her refund because she requested a refund. And they say that they will award her or they will refund her one dollar. One. That's it. Yes, one dollar. That is it. That is an indicator that lawyers are at work because a nominal sum of one dollar is often used in contract law. Mm. But of course, your grandmother is 70 years old. How is her health at this point? It's deteriorating. Um, so now she has, she's been disconnected from, she's 70 years old, and now she has no money. So she's old and sick and broke. Right. Which is the worst thing you could be if you're a Scientologist. Mm. She's disconnected. What does she do? So, so then she, yeah, she kills herself. Oh my God, I am so sorry. What? She kills herself. And, and I, Here's the thing, I didn't actually find out that she committed suicide until I had left the church in 2009. What, so, year did she, what year did she take her own life? It was around 2000. Um, and you didn't know this until... Until 2009, or yeah. I, I mean, my mom never even told me that she'd passed away. My mom was so devastated by it. Um, I remember going into the org one day in 2000 to meet my mom for lunch and she wasn't there and I was handed a letter from her. 
and it said, you know, I'm really sorry. Um, I wasn't able to call you. I, I had to rush off to the US. I, I'm going to an EDS conference and I'll, I'll see you in a few days. And I was like, okay. Um, but your mother was really going to handle her, her mother's suicide. She was going to the funeral and she was even, her CSW, uh, her request uh, for permission to leave, to go into the funeral was denied, but she went anyway. That needs to be pointed out. Uh, Mike Render, uh, you know, very early in his year career, he and his wife had a, an infant child die. Mm. And David Miscavige did not allow Mike Render to go to the funeral. He did not allow him any time to leave. It's disgusting. The other thing I wanted to mention is the church hides the deaths of people. Karen and I only learned that her son Alexander had died through the kindness of a stranger on Facebook. Mm. So you didn't know your grandmother had died? No, I found out a few months later when I was over at my mother's house and she was showing me um, uh, pictures, like family portraits and uh, family photo albums. And I didn't recognize them from, from our collection. And, and I said, oh, where did you get these from? And she said, oh, I, I, while I was in the US at this EDS conference, I went and I saw grandpa. I was like, oh, okay. And then I saw this box and it had my, my grandmother's name on it. Now my grandfather and my, my grandmother are divorced. So when she mm. said she went to see grandpa, I, I kind of, I was like, no, you didn't go and see grandpa. I said, you've got grandma, this is grandma's stuff. Why do you have stuff that's grandma's? And that's when it clicked for me. And I looked at her and she looked at me and I knew and she knew I knew and I was just this moment. And I said, you know, she's, she's dead, isn't she? And she said, you know, I'm really sorry. I, I, I didn't know how to tell you. I'm still really upset about it. I can't talk about it, but um, she never told me it was suicide. Um, I, what did she say? That um, that my grandmother's health was failing and that she causatively dropped her body. So your mother told you the same thing the church said about Aaron Hubbard? Yeah. Causatively dropped her body to go get a new body. Right. I think she was trying to tell me in the, the least painful way. It is what the church calls an acceptable truth. In other words, the, the church has a policy to state what's called an acceptable truth, which could be a lie or you could spin it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's usually a spinning of something like, okay, here's a, here's a good one. So, um, I don't have a, a Birmingham accent and I, I usually get asked like, you know, you, you sound like you're from down South. And I say, oh yeah, I went to school down south. That's an acceptable truth. I don't say, well, I tried to join the Sea Org when I was 11 years old and I ended up in the Cadet Org over there. But I went to school down south. So my Cadet Org experience was my boarding school. These are all acceptable truths. So that you don't have to reveal what's really going on. Yeah. Marika, when did you find out your grandmother had committed suicide? How did that happen? Oh gosh. So, um, me and my sister and my dad, so I'd learned that my parents were under the radar and I'd learned about this man called um, Marty Rathbun and I wanted to go and see him and meet him in person. Um, Question for you, hmm. had you heard of Marty Rathbun when you were inside of the church? No, uh, actually, funnily enough, just a couple of months prior to that. See, because I'm UK public and you know some of the US faces and, and, and management, we don't really see that much. So, um, but anyway, I had been asked to watch that IAS win video, uh, just a couple of months before. So I watched it and there's a bit where David Miscavige says, I think he mentions his name. Anyway, he mentions, he mentions his name and he shows a picture with him. So that was, 
Uh, to clarify, the video we're talking about is the 1993 speech where David Miscavige announces tax exemption. The IRS win, yes. Yes, the IRS. The war is over. Now, periodically, David Miscavige, to reestablish his brand when things are going especially bad for him, will make Scientologists watch that video again. So you're talking about like 2009 when you saw the IRS video? Mm -hmm. And that's where David Miscavige does mention Marty Rathbun. He and Marty walked into the IRS commissioner's office in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. So that's when you first hear Marty's name? Right. And so you wanted to go see Marty? Yeah, I wanted to go see him. Um, so, yeah, we did. We, we didn't live that far from him, actually. Uh, I think it was like a couple hours at the time. I mean, I wasn't, you know, I was visiting my parents, so they didn't live that far from him. So uh, me and my sister... And my dad drove to see him. Uh, we met him for lunch at some Mexican restaurant. That's when my dad mentioned to Marty, basically, this is this is one of the reasons that um, their grandmother killed herself. And me and my sister oh, look at each other. We're like, Grandma killed herself. And then my dad's like, Oh, I'm so sorry. You weren't supposed to know that. Um, yeah, so then that's that's how I found out. You had to be shocked. Yeah, you... I, I mean, it was a little too much to, to, to take in all at once right there. I was just kind of, you know, I just kind of brushed it aside like, wow, okay, I'm going to have to deal with that, you know, ask some questions about that later. Um, it was a bit much. I, I can understand that. Sometimes it's it's just not appropriate in life. You know, you're hit with very bad news. You you have to suck it up and keep going. Right. Yeah, it was definitely one of those moments. Now, when you had time with your parents, did they tell you the true story? Yeah, I, I learned more. But, you know, I know it's 14 years later, but my mom is still very upset about it. Well, no, spiritually... Things can hurt for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, mourning the, the loss of your mother or father or both. I don't have either of my parents. Mm -hmm. But to suddenly find out that your grandmother committed suicide, it's sort of a violation because you, you wanted to think certain things about your grandmother. Mm. Here's the other thing. Um, my other aunt, not the one that's just disconnected, from my cousin, but a different aunt. So she was, uh, after my grandmother's death, she was sent in by Osa to go through all of my grandmother's stuff and remove anything um, negative that she ever wrote or said about Scientology and not destroy it, bring it back to Osa. That is so typical of the Office of Special Affairs. Two examples. One, an OT8 named Rex Fowler in Denver, Colorado, mm -hmm. shot and killed a business associate in cold blood. And then he tried to murder himself. Mm -hmm. When the police figured out that Rex Fowler was the assailant, they were conducting a crime scene investigation. Rex Fowler's wife came in and demanded that she be given Rex Fowler's briefcase. Oh, that's right. Why? Why? Because it contained OT materials, upper level materials. Mm -hmm. The police said no. They inspected it and then later gave it back to his wife. Mm. Marika, do you know the story about Nancy Cartwright, the voice of Bart Simpson? She was engaged to an OT8 named Steve Brackett mm -hmm. here in Los Angeles. They were engaged to be married. Steve Brackett was a big donor but he fell upon hard times, you know, bankruptcy looming. Mm. Steve Brackett, new OT8, drove up to Big Sur in Northern California and parked his car, walked onto a bridge and jumped off it and killed himself. Oh my gosh. Very symbolic death jumping off a bridge. That was his final communication. His bridge ended in death. Local OTs in the church were told that Steve Brackett died in a head-on car accident. They were not told that he killed himself. But they tell so many lies. How do they even keep track of this? This is why they have the Office of Special Affairs keeping files. It's like a Stasi, a police organization. Alexander Jensch dies. Mm. The father-in-law 
calls Osa first for instructions on what to do before he calls 911. Alexander had been dead a long time. And um, immediately, Osa hires a criminal defense attorney here in Los Angeles to represent the family. They apparently scour the scene of Alexander's death, but miss a few things that the coroner finds. So these sort of go in and clean up before the police see what's going on is a very typical Church of Scientology operation. Oh. In other words, we have to keep our PR in. Mm -hmm. Bad things cannot be known. Yeah, it's all about image. Did the church, when they scoured your grandmother's belongings and they take things and keep them, what kind of church does that? Go scour the death scene to make sure there's nothing critical about us. I don't know any other church that does that. Now, going back to Rex Fowler's death, mm -hmm. when Rex Fowler was put on trial for murder, church attorneys went in there and demanded that Scientology have nothing to do with Rex Fowler's murder trial. Mm. This, although Rex had taken probably $200,000 out of the company to donate to the Church of Scientology. That's right. And even though that could have been part of the motive, uh, the reason why Rex Fowler couldn't repay his business associate or employee, that the church demanded that they kept be kept out of the murder trial. So it's a, it's a pretty cold, cold operation. Mm -hmm. Going back to your cousin, mm. Tommy Davis and his wife Jessica visited. Mm -hmm. Did she keep up her part of the bargain? She believes she did. You know, like I said, I mean, she she doesn't really know what she did. Her mother kept saying to her, you know what you did. You know what you did. And she's like, I, I didn't know what I did. I don't know. Please tell me. And it was so obviously, you know, a, a, an OSA operation because my aunt and her ex-husband, who she's been divorced from since, you know, the mid 80s, um, they both called my cousin at the same time to tell her that she was being disconnected from. Really? Mm -hmm. like, don't you find that suspicious? Two people who were divorced and have been for a really long time, both coming together and deciding, hey, you know, let's at exactly the same time disconnect from our daughter. Well, this is typically OSA stage managing everything. Mm -hmm. But we go back to the PR is no, these people are choosing to do it of their own free will. No, they're not. No, they're not. Under the theme of David Miscavige is a petty little bitch, mm -hmm. which I really like that phrase. <laughs> P PLB, petty PLB, little bitch. Right. PLB describes David Miscavige. I think it does. I think it should definitely be a new name for him. Um, it it's a title he deserves. It is a good title, and it, and it it goes beyond mere name calling. It goes into a descriptor of someone who's fairly immature, but also very brutal. Mm. Marika, what's interesting, when we talk about David Miscavige and preferential treatment, when Leah Remini left the church, she felt the full force and weight of disconnection. Mm -hmm. She and her family lost everyone they'd known in the church. Mm -hmm. The same thing happened with Jason Begay. Now, in the case of Leah Remini, her good friend, her best friend, Jennifer Lopez, stood by her side very publicly. And I applaud Jennifer Lopez for doing that. That meant a lot. It meant Jennifer was taking a stand alongside her friend. It sent a message to David Miscavige that I'm not going to play your game. Right. This was a big deal for Jennifer Lopez to do because her father's been in the church a long time. Mm. So yes, there's preferential treatment. There's and David preferential. Oh, David Miscavige is not going to disorder anyone to disconnect from Jennifer Lopez. Right. He's too afraid. He's too afraid to take on J Lo. Hmm. Well, yeah, that's why he's a petty little bitch, because he allows Tom Cruise to see Suri. Yeah, so if he is going to um, apply to Tom Cruise the same rules that he applies to your everyday Scientologist, then no, Tom Cruise wouldn't be allowed to see Suri. And Katie Holmes should be officially disconnected from and have her own SP declare. That's part of the Church of Scientology is the unequal treatment, preferential yes. treatment of celebrities. Yes. And really, if you're broke and a nobody and sick, then we'll get rid of you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They, did, they often, didn't care about my grandmother. 
She had no money. She was old. They didn't care about my aunt. You know, she had a, a physical condition and she wasn't able to work that hard within the Sea Org. They got rid of her. That's what they do. I mean, it's disgusting. If you're in the Church of Scientology, God help you if you weaken. Mm. And, and that's really sad coming from a church. Like, this is a church, people. But it's not a church. It's a cult. But, I mean, it has church status, and it's called a church, and it shows no compassion. Here's a, a, a parting shot for me on disconnection. Just because something is written doesn't mean you have to practice it. For example, when I was in the Christian church, there's some really violent verses in the Bible. Mm. In the Old Testament, there's a verse where you can stone your children to death if they're disobedient. Oh my gosh. That doesn't get... Yeah, no, it's there. <laughs> wow. Nevertheless, the modern Christian church doesn't practice stoning people to death. Mm. Shockingly, Muslim extremists behead people. Mm -hmm. But my point is just because something's written in a holy book doesn't mean you have to practice it. You're free to be intelligent about your own religion and not practice those parts of it that are violent or disturbing. That is a very good point. If you want to go by the Scientology, what's true for you datum, well then why, you know, why would you be basically applying something in your life that you don't believe in? Probably because what's true for you is true for you actually means what's true for the church will be true for you or will declare you. Mm -hmm. Marika, final question. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, is a member of the Church of Scientology truly self-determined? No. No, not at all. And there's many reasons why. You know, one of them being, if there's something that you, you don't understand, that you read, you know, book or lecture, LRH scripture, you have to find your misunderstood word. So you're not really in a position where you're allowed to say, you know what, I don't understand this, it doesn't make sense to me, or I don't agree with this. So that's one thing. Another thing is if, you, if, you, if you're in doubt about something, doubt is PTSD. So a lot of Scientologists, um, when they make decisions, they don't think long and hard about it or, or contemplate things. They make that decision. It's like a snap judgment because there is this stigma to taking your time and, and thinking through something. That would be a calm lag. Right, yeah, a calm Which lag is, is, is one of them. But no, but actually thinking. A guy named Ron Salvo, mm -hmm. he made these interviews where he goes, it's aberrated when you get into think, think, figure, figure. Mm -hmm. It's aberrated. Think, think, figure, figure. You should, if you know the data, you don't have to think, think, figure, figure. And there is a whole denigration of thinking this. Yeah. Thinking this, thinking this is aberration. No, uh, certainty is knowledge. Mm-hmm. And when you, ha when you say certainty is knowledge, all you're saying is it's okay to be a religious fundamentalist. I'm certain of what L. Ron Hubbard in Scientology says, therefore I have certainty, therefore I'm going to steamroll you. Mm. I have certainty. How dare you invalidate my win? So due to that, if there's something you don't understand, well then it, that's because of a misunderstood word that you have. You're not allowed to really contemplate think about things and, and make a decision and then the ways that Scientologists make decisions, the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics has really come, become the greatest good for David Miscavige and the Church of Scientology. There's, there's not really free thought within Scientology, so you, you can't make your own decision because of that. When you leave the church and you start thinking for yourself, it must be tremendously liberating. Oh my god. <laughs> it's, it's fabulous. It's really nice. It's, it's nice to be able to think something and then not try and unthink it. It's nice to be able to evaluate things and say what they are, call them what they are. Extremely liberating. And that's part of why we have Surviving Scientology Radio and YouTube, for just to allow people like you to tell their stories. Marika, as always, it's been a pleasure having you in the studio. Thank you so much. It's been great talking to you. We look forward to talking to you again. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you for listening, and as always, we'll be in very good touch.